Hi, and welcome to episode number 108 of the weekly Google Cloud Platform podcast. I'm Mark Mandel, and I'm here with my colleague, Melanie Warwick. How are you doing today, Melanie? Happy New Year, Mark. <laughs> it's the beginning of the year, trying to get back into the groove of things. Trying to. <laughs> did you have a good holiday? I did. How was yours? It was good. It was good. It was low-key, which is nice. Nice. So this week, uh, we've got some friends of yours. Yeah, they're my friends. They're we hang, friends. We hang out all the time. That's what I figured. At the pool. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, this week we are going to be talking to Malika Cantor and Peter Norvig, and they're going to tell us all about Launchpad Studio, which is basically a program that supports startups, especially machine learning startups. But before we get into the interview, we're going to, of course, start off with the cool things of the week and at the end with the question of the week. And our question of the week is going to be about how, if you're a startup, how would you get credits to work on GCP? Before we get into the cool thing of the week, what we do want to do is briefly mention about vulnerabilities that have come out last week around our modern computers. And specifically, these vulnerabilities are related to modern processors, and they impact things like your personal computer, your mobile devices, and the cloud. Now, there's a lot of content out there. There's um, many different links, and we'll definitely provide some of these on our website. And we have uh, some great information that our security group has done on a, on a blog that we will provide around GCP and how they're working to support that. But the main things to understand is that Meltdown Inspector are two vulnerabilities that you want to be aware of. You want to make sure you're updating your operating system. You want to make sure that you are updating all the things whenever you have the opportunity to on your phones, on your laptops, on whatever cloud services you're working with. And Mark, I think you wanted to touch on this briefly as well. Yeah, we're going to link to all the, the blog posts we are not security experts. I think Melanie knows way more about this than I do. She can talk about it for ages. But most importantly, yeah, definitely upgrade all the things. One of the things that I'm just going to literally read off here for like Google Cloud, right? So if you're running Compute Engine, Kubernetes Engine, Dataflow, Dataproc, uh, there are some extra customer actions that are needed. Again, links are in the, in the show notes, but definitely go through those. Make sure you get those implemented uh, as soon as you possibly can. All right. So check out the links. Make sure you're up to speed on that. And let's talk about cool things of the week. Yeah, absolutely. So every time we seem to come on the podcast, we talk about GPUs getting cheaper. Uh, so why don't we talk about GPUs getting cheaper? So we're introducing preemptible GPUs, which is kind of neat. So if you've ever used uh, preemptible GCE instances, uh, so instances that may die for about 24 hours, but you get a very large deduction in price uh, when you use them, uh, you're now able to use GPU instances on those. now beta and available for GPUs on preemptible instances. Uh, we'll have a link in the show notes as well to the blog post, which links to the documentation and how you can do them. But basically, yeah, if you want to do uh, batch type processing for GPUs and you want it to be a lot cheaper to do it, uh, especially if you're using preemptible instances already, this is a really nice thing for you. Yes, cheaper is always better. All right. And the other cool thing of the week is that we have a couple of awesome lists that we wanted to share with everybody. We've got some links we'll put into the website as always. Uh, but specifically, if you've played around with GitHub, you've seen the awesome and awesome list of awesomeness. Uh, there are some awesome lists for TensorFlow. There are awesome lists for Kubernetes. There's awesome lists for GCP, Google Cloud Platform itself. And the awesome lists are really, you know, using contributors, contributing what they think are some really great training resources, as well as real world application samples, libraries, uh, analytics. They put out there what they think are good tools and resources to have access to and, and consolidate that down into a list. And I think, Mark, you said you found in here something that you guys had built? Yeah, I didn't I didn't realize it. I was just looking at this now. There was a gRPC sample that myself, Sandeep, uh, Dinesh, and a couple of other developer advocates also did some work on where we took the old game Simon with the multicolors and made it playable over the internet uh, using gRPC and Kubernetes. And that's on the list, which oh, I feel a little proud. That's quite yeah, you nice. Should. You should feel there we go. Good that's really yourself. good. Cool. And finally, uh, is a really nice, cool thing of the week that is coming from the community, which is really cool. I'm going to butcher your name. I'm really sorry. I'm going to go with Will Fuchs, maybe. A uh, data scientist at Defeaty Group uh, wrote a Medium post called How We Implemented a Fully Serverless Recommender System Using GCP. This is a really cool article in they use App Engine, BigQuery, Google Cloud Storage, Dataproc, Datastore, Dataflow to build a recommendation engine. But they also talk through the recommendation algorithm, which I love is called Dim Sum. I don't know why, nice. but that's fantastic. Basically to build a collaborative filtering recommendation engine, which is... Yeah, it's a really good read. You should totally check it out. Thanks. All right. Well, now that we know what our cool things of the week are, we're going to go ahead and jump into the main content. So we are excited that we have with us 
Malika Cantor, who is the global lead of Launchpad Studio, and Peter Norvig, who is the research director of machine learning at Google. So before we get started into talking about Launchpad Studio, we want to talk about a little bit about your background. So please introduce yourself a little more. Yeah, so my name is Malika Cantor. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the global lead at Launchpad Studio. Launchpad sits under developer relations at Google. Um, we are basically the accelerator engine of Google, so we run different accelerator initiatives focused on supporting various startup ecosystems across the world, and Studio is focused on supporting specifically applied AI and machine learning companies globally. Thanks. And Peter, we don't really know who you are, so do you mind telling us a little about yourself? Hi, I'm Peter Norvig. I'm a director of research here at Google. I've been at Google since 2001. The company was a little bit smaller then. And I've uh, been focusing on uh, machine learning for a, a long time, uh, working on uh, various tools and applications. And uh, about a year ago, I started getting involved with Launchpad to uh, help others uh, learn how to use those tools. And you did write the canonical book on AI that most people tend to look back to with Stuart Russell. That's right. So, uh, you know, I'm in the uh, dot com domain now, but I've had all the top levels. So I was in uh, .edu and was professor for a while. I was in uh, .gov, ran computer science at NASA, and along the way, uh, uh, wrote a textbook and kind of got involved with a variety of other projects. Got a little bit of background there. I know, Malika, we were talking about it too, that you've had some great experiences around the VC space as well as, especially in China, and we want to get into that a little further later. But first, let's talk a little bit about uh, Launchpad Studio. So you're explaining an overview of it, but what led to this project? What inspired you guys to, to get going with it? Sure. So, um, I mean, as you mentioned, I uh, was working in venture capital, um, investing in applied AI, machine learning, and robotics companies for a little while. And one of the things I realized was that a lot of the startups didn't really have the tools that they needed to be successful. And so one of my thoughts was, well, where can I go and what can I do to actually make a difference? And um, this was about six months ago. I started like Peter getting involved with a Launchpad team and saw a great opportunity to build a program that would actually allow us to gather more insights on what startups working on applied machine learning in different industries actually needed and for us to then go back to Google and, and other potential large tech companies and, and inform them on what were the tools that these startups needed to actually implement things at scale and, and grow and, and be successful. So um, that was sort of why I got involved. And um, very early on, um, you know, we started talking with Peter um, about his interest in, um, you know, again, gathering these insights, almost like developing a lab where we were working with great companies, um, you know, trying different things with them, bringing them amazing mentors. Um, um, and then figuring out if there were any sort of learnings across these different companies and industries that would then indicate that there was you know, the, an opportunity to build a tool on, on the Google side. And so this could be an API, this could be a new type of service um, that would then have impact um, across the startup ecosystem and everywhere in the world and across industries. And the program itself, it's a six month incubator program to bring in and startups, is that right? Effectively, yes. So it's a six month program. Um, the way, so once we decided that we basically wanted to develop all of these insights, we started thinking sort of from first principles how it would make sense to set it up. And we decided together to focus on one specific industry vertical at a time uh, to allow us to really go deep and, and understand what was going on there and, and really gather really solid insights. So right now we're focused on the applications of AI machine learning in healthcare and biotech. Um, so we basically onboard companies on a rolling basis that are focused on this vertical. We already have four companies that we've been working with for a couple of months um, and you know, checking in with them every couple of weeks. Um, they come in and work with us every few months and we'll be onboarding new companies actually just in two weeks. Um, we have a big next event. And so they come in, um, they meet with some, a, a lot of different product teams at Google, but also mentors outside. And then in this whole process, we're basically gathering information about some of their challenges. So for instance, you know, I've been using TensorFlow, but I just can't figure out how to, you know, scale up this part of my infrastructure. Or, you know, I have this data set, but, you know, especially in the healthcare space, you know, the, the disease I'm looking at, 
only allows for me to have quite a limited data set. How can I amplify and augment that data set to actually use some of the models that are best used in the machine learning space? A lot of these types of questions we're already starting to see. Um, and I'd love to talk more about some of the other sort of overarching challenges that we're already starting to identify. So you're actually talking about that. Are those You said in the beginning, you sort of went, there are these tools that are missing. Is those the tools that are missing for those sort of problems that people are trying to solve? Is that is that kind of the gist? Yeah, and I might also let Peter jump in here. I think we're, all of this is very much a hypothesis. You know, we sort of came at this, and, and maybe a good analogy is, you know, we were thinking, all right, you know, lean startup methodologies. Like, you know, we've been accustomed to, to hearing this term, and, and we were thinking about it with machine learning, and this is something I started seeing already in, in my VC days, is does it really work? Like, can you fail fast? Can you pivot? as a company that's leveraging machine learning. And our general sort of, you know, understanding was, well, no, actually, we don't really think that it's possible. And it's because the tools are lacking. Like, there are some tools, like, you know, TensorFlow is an incredible tool. Um, GCP, with, we have a lot of, of other ones out there, and, you know, other people are building great tools, too. But it's still extremely difficult, as a company leveraging these new technologies, to do what we think startups should be able to do. And so through Studio, our hope is to really try to understand what are the limitations of the tools that are already on the market, which are quite limited, to be honest, and then inform what are tools that we should be building to hopefully make it easier and easier for startups to pivot and to fail fast in the machine learning space. Yeah. So I think it's a combination of the tools and the best practices and the knowledge and experience. Uh, so I came to this, uh, you know, I'd been working internally with teams where, uh, you know, a large percentage of the team have uh, PhDs in machine learning, right? And so they had some background and intuition about what to build, uh, but it was still really hard. And now we want to say, uh, well, not everybody has that luxury of, of being able to have a bunch of experts in machine learning on your team. Maybe you're you're in your domain, whether it's uh, healthcare or energy or transportation or whatever your, your, your company is doing, and you mostly have experts in that. And they don't have uh, the background that, that we had access to. Uh, but you have an idea that you have some data, you want to do something useful with that data, and you want to produce a product. How can we do that? And some of it is having the right tool, but some of it is just knowing what the whole process is of how you go about starting from the raw data or even how do you go about collecting data if you don't have any yet and building the whole pipeline and uh, evolving that and keeping going and we, we just don't have experience with that we have uh, we've done a lot of uh, one by ones but you know if you look at the history of software engineering we've been figuring out how to build software for 50 years and we've only been trying to figure out how to build machine learning systems for uh, a small number of years so so understanding how all that works is the key challenge now. And you've had the resources finally to be able to experiment with building out those machine learning, but barriers I know are definitely people. Yeah, so, so you see, you know, there has been this big explosion in the last couple of years, and, and I think that's a, a couple of things coming together. Uh, a lot of it, as you say, has to do with the resources, that uh, now uh, more and more data is online, as, as you know, the internet is everywhere, and data is being captured in digital form. Uh, so that's available. Far greater computing power that wasn't available in the past, be able to do things that you couldn't try before. And just, I think, one success builds on another, that if somebody proves they can do something, then somebody else says, uh, well, th that worked for them. I think I can do it now, too. Well, out of the four companies that you're working with currently, what are some of the tools that they are using, and then also some of the tooling that you both think could definitely, I mean, we're talking on it, but anything specific that's standing out that you think could be useful? Yeah, um, so in, in the companies right now, again, we're like, in the early days of, of the program, a lot of it is, you know, mentorship, you know, giving insights, in, in terms of how they could be leveraging, for instance, GCP better, some of the APIs that we've already built. Um, you know, they're working with teams like the cloud machine learning engine team, you know, the cloud AI team, but then also the Android Things team, which is trying to sort of push a lot of learning onto the device now. You know, we, we're basically working with a lot of different product teams that are coming in and mentoring startups on what are some of the services that we have already that some of these companies could be leveraging as part of their stack so that they don't build that themselves because there's there's no point there. You know, what, what's interesting 
to, to the software engineering point that, that Peter was talking about is, you know, a lot of the, the issues that we're seeing startups are having is actually around architecture and around, you know, with software development, you're thinking about building an end product. But with machine learning, you're thinking about how to build a scalable data pipeline and how to retrain a model. And it's, you know, the end product is almost like a, a byproduct. It's, it, it's not necessarily what you're moving towards. And so we're, we're starting to try to figure out, you know, are there things that we could be building, and we definitely are on the way to this already with you know, initiatives like AutoML in terms of you know automating certain parts of you know this this process of, of building you know your software engineering and, and and development to help these startups do this more quickly um, and better. You know the concept of potentially automating DevOps also. Like I think there's a lot of opportunities here, um, but I think that that is one thing that we've seen that's been really interesting. Sort of aside from other problems like I mentioned around you know data UI UX. There's also you know to Peter's point. There, there aren't tools for understanding how regulation is going to affect your product. And so there it becomes more about best practices and sharing best practices across these different companies that are working in one industry. You know, our hope is maybe that we can even build a curriculum to try to help inform, you know, okay, well, be aware of regulation, be aware of how to go about building, you know, how to do software development, how to think about your data pipeline, how to think about UI and UX. And so, again, to Peter's point, it goes beyond just the idea of tools. It's more about sort of sharing best practices and learning from one another. So that actually sounds really interesting. I'm, I'm quite curious. You were talking, Peter, about sort of the scarcity of resources in terms of people, people with the knowledge. Are you finding that one of the big challenges is that people who may come in without that machine learning or AI knowledge have a more, I'm going to say, quote unquote, uh, traditional software development background? So the pipeline and the, the way that they build things for machine learning and AI is, is, I don't know how different, but different enough that it's causing a disconnect or that's like a big hurdle. Are you finding that a yeah. challenge? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, so, so one of it is, is really changing the mindset for what you're trying to do, right? In traditional software engineering, uh, you're kind of thinking like a mathematician or a logician, and you're, you know, you say, well, in the endpoint, I could co- sort of prove my program correct, and you know, in reality, you only do that in the classroom. You don't do it for any realistic program, but you're uh, sort of aiming in that direction. I mean, we have tools like uh, test frameworks where you're making assertions and you're, the assertions are of the form, uh, the, the result of this should be equal to that, or this should be true. Uh, so it's very binary, true, false, either you got it or you don't. Uh, but with machine learning, it's not like that. It's not mathematical, it's more like a, a empirical or a scientific endeavor. So it's like doing biology, where you do an experiment on the world, you observe the results of the experiment. It's not that it's true or false. It's just uh, you know most of the time it's going to be this, and some of the time it's going to be something else. And so making that change from thinking from a logic true-false to a kind of probabilistic, messy world, uh, that's hard for a lot of people mm-hmm. to, to give up on, on what they thought was the solid bedrock and now embrace this uncertainty. Kind of the, uh, what do you mean this is only going to happen sometimes? Yeah, yeah. So one of the things I wanted to know is what do you think is making your, or what kind of companies do you accept into the program? What makes them successful in this type of program? Yeah, so our selection criteria um, is quite simple. So um, first it's, are you applying machine learning or AI to the industry that we've said we're focused on at the present time, which is healthcare and biotech right now, and we're going to be announcing other industry tracks in the course of 2018. Um, The next one is, are you trying to solve a specific challenge related to machine learning in the next six months? Um, And the reason why that is part of our selection criteria is we don't want to basically take startups in the wrong direction. Like there are companies that are going to be implementing AI machine learning at some point. There are some companies that never will. And we just want to make sure that the companies that we do work with, because we put a tremendous amount of resources and time on our end, but we also expect a lot 
from the companies in terms of being there in the program, you know, um, implementing a lot of the, the feedback that we give them. We want it to be core to what their roadmap is in the next six months. One thing that I should clarify is our main engagement mechanism with the startups, so we don't actually invest in the companies. Um, it's a slightly uh, untraditional accelerator program in that we actually get them to uh, draw up a project proposal of what they want to accomplish with Google in the space of six months, and we select them based on their project proposal. So they actually have to give us metrics, um, you know, deliverables, goals for what they want to um, achieve, and then we give them a lot of feedback in the selection process, and then based on that project, we actually um, admit them into the program. What kind of metrics? Um, it really would depend. So, you know, if you're a computer vision company looking at cell dynamics um, and your project is focused on improving precision accuracy of detection of a certain kind of disease looking at those cells, then it would be improving your precision accuracy from 83% to 96%. And that would be the metric that we're basically working um, on together. But if it's a company working in the natural language space, then, you know, it might be slightly different. It might be more about, you know, what are, how many errors can we detect um, in speech. Um, it could be, so it really, it depends from one company to another. But yeah, that's, I'd say, is, is the main uh, selection criteria for sure. For us, we, you know, it's it's less about um, selling Google products or, or you know, it, we don't really have a very um, clear sort of direct um, you know, gaining back to Google, but Peter and I definitely, when we're looking at these companies, are thinking about what can we learn. And um, sometimes it's even more just from a personal <laughs> intellectual perspective of, wow, this company is doing something that we never thought would be possible, and we think there's something really interesting to learn here. Uh, but definitely we're, we're, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, trying to figure out what Google could be doing and building to make this whole ecosystem successful. So the more a company gives us insights in to that, the, the better it's going to be because we're trying to do things at scale here beyond just making these four companies and, and other companies in the program successful too. So I'm, I'm actually curious almost at a higher level too, um, you, you obviously have verticalized it in the ML space, but now I'm also curious like why specifically focusing on ML? Like the startup space is huge. We do a lot of stuff across Google, Google Cloud. Why the emphasis specifically on ML? Yeah. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll definitely let Peter jump in here too. Um, from a Launchpad perspective, so there's actually an, another phenomenal program that's being run out of Launchpad called Launchpad Accelerator that's been running um, for a few years now, been extremely successful, and they, what they focus on is supporting growth stage startups in emerging markets. And the whole vision of Launchpad, and um, so we're affiliated with Ecosystem, which you know our whole vision and mission is to support startup ecosystems everywhere in the world, is to identify startup ecosystems that we think are particularly under-supported. And so with Accelerator, it was, you know, sort of thinking about next billion users. What could we be doing with startups globally that would actually give us insights and really make an impact? And then with Studio, again, the thought process was similar is, you know, we have this, as, as Peter was saying, this revolution going on, this boom of like more and more startups that are starting to, you know, for better or for worse, use AI and machine learning in certain cases, not in a very real way. But, you know, there, there was, we identified a need and an, also an opportunity for Google to really make a difference here. Um, you know, to, as Peter said, use some of our expertise of building some of these products internally and actually see if we can teach anything and learn anything from these companies that are going really deep, looking at specific use cases and, and trying to scale and, and productize some of the, these things we've been working on for a few years. Yeah, you know, I think at, at Google we have the luxury of, uh, in some ways, being able to see into the future. That we're at such a scale that we run into some of the problems and opportunities uh, before uh, other people are at a, at a smaller scale. So we've been doing this for a while, and we've seen these opportunities, and now we see a way to uh, share that to to help other companies overcome what what we've done in the past that they're just starting to face now. You were saying before that there's mentorship that's provided, it's a six months pro program. Is it similar to some of the other incubators out there or is it different? Is there certain things that make it similar or different? Yeah, so I think as I mentioned earlier, the main difference is that we don't actually invest. We don't have a financial relationship with um, the startups that we work with. There's various reasons why that is the case. Um, you know. 
one of them being that actually it would be very complicated for Google to have a financial relationship with some of the startups that we're bringing in from different places in the world. Um, you know, you mentioned China earlier. Um, it's, you know, we're, we're very excited to be able to work with companies um, without having some of that red tape. Um, but it's also because we want to make it very clear that this is not a strategic endeavor for Google and that this is, you know, almost a room of peers of, you know, we have a lot to learn from you. We, you know, in, in many cases, we have mentors from our product teams at Google who, you know, come to ask and, and, and tell us how much they've learned from the startups that they've been working with. Um, so that's one main difference. The other one is, um, as I also mentioned, we admit companies on a rolling basis. So we don't really believe in the concept of classes. You know, from, from my background working with startups, and, and Peter has too, a lot of people on our team were very conscientious of the fact that, you know, startups can't just drop everything, you know, every like once in a while and, and, and say, okay, we're going to go and, and join this program and, and, you know, basically not focus on product development for however long. And, and so the entire program is designed in a way that's trying to be very mindful of that and is saying, look, you know, you're closing your round right now. It might not make sense for you to join this program. But in a month, when we onboard our next batch, like we'd love for you to to come in. So that's um, the other one. The third aspect I'd say that it is a little bit different is that we have no size fits all, no one size fits all. So. It's, um, it's completely tailored to each company. Uh, we admit companies that have 12 people and have raised you know, $100,000, and companies that have about 1,000 people and have raised $70 million. So that's kind of the spread that we already have in our, in our current batch. Um, and so you can imagine that a company that has 12 people and a company that has 1,000 needs very different kinds of support. So we actually really focus on you know, identifying what are the challenges of each company and then build a, a totally custom um, sort of mentorship program and, and, and solution for, for each company, which is one of the reasons we only work with very few companies at a time. Cool. Um, you talked, a lot, um, both of you talked about sort of that feedback loop, which sounds fantastic, and I think that sounds wonderful. I'm super curious to know um, what's been the most sort of interesting or surprising or like what feedback that you've got or, or learning that you've had from working with these companies? Peter, do you have any so far that you'd like to share? Uh, I think it's just that uh, companies are really focused on on solving their problem and serving their customers, and so they see the technology as a as a way towards that goal, and uh, the the technology itself, exactly what it is, uh, they don't care as long as long as you can get there, and so making it easier for them to uh, take advantage of that is is. Uh, what we're trying to do. So one of the questions that I had, you both were saying this, and I've heard this a lot lately, where people will interchange AI and ML. How do you define it? How do you think about it in regards to, especially when working with these startups? Yeah. So I guess I, I define artificial intelligence as uh, doing something smart. So uh, figuring out what you want to do and, and doing it well in a way that you uh, didn't know how to do before. You know, so, so in some ways, I say that uh, regular software is uh, defining a program to do something that you know how to do, and AI is doing it for something that you don't know how to do. Uh, and then machine learning just means you're going to do that by uh, learning from examples rather than having the programmer write down some rules or something. And you know, back in the 1980s, uh, uh, we had the term uh, AI, and we also had the term expert systems. And what that meant is you got an expert in medicine or whatever it was, and you interviewed them, and you figured out what they knew, and then you wrote down uh, rules that represented what they know. Uh, and so that was AI by applying expert knowledge, figuring it out by hand. Now we tend not to do that. We find that that's brittle and slow, and instead we do it by collecting data and learning from the data. So machine learning is achieving AI through applying examples, and expert systems is achieving AI through uh, understanding knowledge. And we also were talking a little bit before, I just wanted to touch on it briefly before we start to wrap up, but uh, you've got this great experience working in China and seeing kind of where their world is going around the AI space. So just as a general thought of where, you know, AI is leading us for, for applied in real world business applications, what's your perception of this ecosystem? 
Yeah, well, I think it was extremely exciting to see Fei Fei uh, open the AI Research Institute in Beijing. You know, um, mid December last year. A, a lot of interest and excitement, and a lot of people working on it, and and、uh, we're seeing new things coming out. So, for anyone who's listening and is all like, "I've got a business, and we're doing ML, and this program sounds amazing," how do they get involved? Is there a way? Yes. So,、um, just go on our website. There's an application.、Um, it only takes about ten minutes to fill out.、Um, we would love to、um, get an application from you.、Um, you're actually allowed to apply even if you're not working on healthcare and biotech, because we're looking at applications to also influence the next industry verticals that we'll be announcing. So,、um, again, we're、um, admitting companies on a rolling basis.、Um, applications are open across、uh, industry verticals,、um, but we will be working mostly with companies in the healthcare and, and biotech space in the next few months.、Um, also, if you aren't a startup but would like to refer a company,、um, please reach out to. Me and maybe we can even share my information. Yes, well, we'll definitely have that in the show notes.、Um, and then the final thing is、um, also if you are a subject matter expert, because I think one of the big themes in in this talk was basically effectively moving AI machine learning out of the hands of just AI experts and moving them increasingly into the hands of subject matter experts like healthcare and biotech experts. If you are a healthcare and biotech expert or someone else in in another industry, you're really passionate about、um, applying you know, machine learning and AI to your industry. And you'd like to become a mentor? Again, please reach out. We work with academics, with you know industry veterans, with ex、uh, CEOs. You know, we'd love to hear about your experience and and、um, you know your expertise. And nice. Yeah. nice that you give it such a breadth in terms of being willing to take in the mentors. In terms of、um, yeah, one of the things I know we were talking about before was that you guys have an event coming up in a couple weeks. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So、um, basically, it's our second high touch point. So that's what we call、um, the event when the startups basically fly in. In certain cases, we have two companies that are based outside the U.S. and two companies in the U.S. right now, and they come and basically get a few days to a week of back to back workshops and meetings with a lot of Google teams and external mentors, like I mentioned. So、uh, our next high touch point is is coming up. We're going to be onboarding a few new. Companies,、um, so you know, if you're interested in seeing what other types of use cases and companies we're going to be supporting moving forward, definitely keep an eye on our website and on our、um, Google Developers blog.、Um, and yeah, we're we're really excited to to keep working with these companies and, as we mentioned, you know, develop product methodologies for machine learning and, and hopefully build better tools for this whole ecosystem. Thank you. Is there anything else that you both wanted to touch on before we? Close out. This is really great to hear about Lunchpad Studio and and get some insights in terms of how you're supporting startups. Yeah, I guess the only thing is,、um, if Peter has any other thoughts, because you know, I, him and I have had a lot of conversations about this, about you know his interest and passion, and again, you know, basically empowering people who aren't AI experts、um, across different industries. Yeah. Yeah. I guess、uh, we really enjoy working with companies and understanding what their needs are and、uh, and what kind of tools they want and and、uh, and how we're going to build that and uh, uh, we see that as as real challenges going forward. You know, so I think a good example of that is with、uh, speech recognition, where we've made great strides in the last few years,、uh, where now you can talk to your phone and we're going to get most of the words right.、Uh, But now there's a next big step of you got all the words right, but how do you respond to those words? And 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 that doesn't have to do just with language. That has to do with what is it that you're trying to achieve. And so we've got to give the companies the capability to say, when I recognize these words, here's what I should do, and do that in a way that、uh, they can understand and build a good product without having them having to be experts in speech recognition and machine learning and linguistics and everything else, but just integrate it into their product. And、uh, you know, again, it's the, it's like in in regular software engineering, we figured out how to build menus and and buttons and mouse clicks、uh, over decades, and now we have to do the same thing with a with a speech interface, and it's all going to be new. And、uh, and we don't know how to do it yet, so we're we're looking to、uh, partner with companies and help figure it out together. 
Yeah, and so I think to Peter's point, it's almost like come and help us learn, you know, and and teach us what you need. And um, you know, we're we're really excited about working with a lot of people. So. Nice. And actually, just one other question, Peter. What got you inspired to do AI in general? Like, what got you into the field? If I may ask, a slight, <laughs> slight side note. Uh, it just seemed like a really exciting field, and uh, you know, I was in high school, and I was uh, lucky enough that my high school had both a uh, computer class and a linguistics class. It was, it was rare that you you uh, had computers in in the high school in those days, and. And I took those two classes and said, hey, could we put these two together? And, and my teacher wisely said, uh, yeah, it's possible, but not with what you know. So uh, ever since, I've been trying to, <laughs> to learn enough to be able to do it. <laughs> That's great that she gave you that kind of challenge and that you took the challenge. I'm glad you both were able to join us. Thank you so much for sharing the information around Launchpad Studios. And uh, anything else that you wanted to mention or anything else you wanted to plug before we, we wrap this up? All right. Well, thank you very much to both of you for taking the time today and having a chat with us. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Malika and Peter, for that great interview. We appreciated the insights around Launchpad Studio, especially for those startups out there that are machine learning and want to have access to different tooling and, and resources. If you have any questions or want additional insights on Launchpad Studio, we will, as always, put links on our website. And now let's talk about the question of the week. So, Mark... If I am a startup and I want credits to work on GCP, what is available to me? Yeah, so we have a whole startups program. Um, we may have talked about it previously on the podcast, but I think it's changed a little since then, which is kind of cool. So if you're a startup and you're like, oh man, I really want to use uh, Google Cloud for it, you can go to cloud.google.com slash startups. Uh, and it'll show you the startup page, which is here. Um, and there are different tiers that are available right now for different types of uh, startup packages. So you can get anywhere from $3,000 in credit all the way up to $100,000 in credit for one year, including as well like 24-7 support, office hours, uh, spotlights, like all sorts of different things, depending on what tier you're on and what sort of needs you have. There are several, actually, we've had Descartes, Descartes Labs, which have been on the podcast more than once, is one of those people who came through that program. Um, the one thing to know, though, if you are a startup and you're looking uh, and you want to come through this program, you need to apply through your incubator, accelerator, or VC firm. Um, there's a long list of all those people that we work with, our platform partners. Uh, I think I counted 142. Nice. Yeah. It's a good number of people to be working with. So yeah, if you are a small business and you're looking for some credits and it gives some insights in terms of like the size, what that means, a little bit of information around who would qualify for the program, check out our link. You'll see that there's start package, there's a spark package, and there's a surge package in terms of the number of credits that you can potentially get hold of. And this can be applied to all of GCP and Firebase. So Yes. Actually, that's a really good point that it goes to both GCP and Firebase. Yes. Which is also super cool. If you aren't uh, part of one of those groups, those incubators or accelerator programs, there is a mailing list you can sign up for just to get updates to see if anything changes or, or if new people come on board. Um, that's there. And obviously, free trial is also obviously available. There we go. Well, that wraps us up for our, at least our first interview out the gate for 2018. Anything you want to actually share or any places you're going to be in the next couple of weeks? I'm, I'm not traveling very much. q ones for me is very quiet. Normally, I'm just sitting around trying to get things done for a Game Developers Conference in March, just trying to get ramped up for that. Uh, how about yourself? Are you off anywhere? Nothing to announce right now, but uh, probably later. Yeah. Stuff coming on. All right, cool. Well, Melanie? Thank you for joining me for the first episode of the year of 2018. It's done. Yeah, it's done. And thank you all for listening. And we'll see you all next week. 